Hi, good morning and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I'm JJ Walsh in Hiroshima. Thanks for joining us. Now today we have a follow-up talk with the amazing Mirosa Bakura. Thank you so much for joining again, Miro. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Now today we are going to talk a little bit, we didn't have time last time to have a recap of what we saw and enjoyed this year at the Minka Summit 2024 in Hanasi Village, rural Kyoto. Uh, let's start with some of the workshops. Did you catch any of the workshops this year? Not many. I was presenting quite a lot, so I missed a lot of the workshops. But it seemed very nice. I've seen uh, some uh, kids and people like doing the thatched roof experience. I think that's super lovely. And yes, so here in the, in the photo, uh, you can see where they had the Minka Mall. Uh, behind and then I'm taking this picture from where the presentations were and they're doing the thatch so how to do a straw house roof have you seen kind of a coming back of thatch roofing in your area too Miro? not really uh, we don't get snow here in Shizuoka there isn't many traditional thatched roofs here anymore um, apparently there was uh, meanwhile, since our last talk, uh, I found this lovely hidden village up in mountains in Shizuoka that was founded by samurais who had to run away for their life because they lost in a battle and they founded a small village, 12 houses, beautiful houses, like I found a house that has family crests on their shoji. <laughs> And unfortunately, a lot of them burned down. Uh, the one I went to and have a look at is going to get torn down. But we're going to relocate it and save it and preserve it before, so it doesn't go to waste. Wonderful. But the so, old grandpa you... told yeah. me that they were doing thatched roofs up in the mountain as well. That there was nice. a pool too on the top of a mountain and it had very good uh, conditions for growing this trust. But That's other than... Fantastic. And then that, one, you know. one of the Minka Summit uh, field trips was going out to the beautiful rural area of the village of Miyama. Uh, did you attend this one, going out to no, the village? I didn't. I uh, didn't manage to get there early in the morning because I was driving a lot of people from Kyoto to Yeah, no, no, uh, that's fine. I, it was a really beautiful village and it was nice to see, like, when it there, kind of ties in well with the workshop. So when you're seeing how the thatch roof is made, how it's quite a difficult process uh, in old Japan, they used to all work together and do different houses in the in the community. But then this uh, town of Miyama, people are still living in these houses. Uh, I did see you at the two M two six design thatch house. Now that was beautiful. And one of the things that really struck me, uh, one of the co-founders was saying she loved how the thatch roof collected the humidity and the sound of the rain was so soft and romantic compared to the hard tiles they used to have. Uh, so that was great. What impressed you about this visit? I've seen their house three years ago when the first Minka Summit happened and they did a lot of work. Like... They've been working hard on their Minka to renovate it. And they mentioned that they started collecting the, the straws for the thatched roof three years ago. And yeah, finally got it done. It looks astounding. And wow. it's good, but I cannot imagine how much, how much work it was. Oh, sounded like it was a lot of work. But, but she, was, she was telling me uh, the artisan that they worked with because they wanted to learn how to do the thatch themselves. Uh, and they are talented, skilled artists and designers themselves. The person who taught them was so impressed how quickly they were learning and able to do it. And then now they have the knowledge, so they're going to be able to pass on that knowledge to other people, which is fun fantastic. That's important. <clears throat> yeah. Did you go for those field trips on the Kaminka summits to that big, nice village you just showed? I did. I did. Yeah, it was lovely. So there was only two houses in the village you could go inside that were open okay. to the public, um, but it was so well preserved. And then you could walk around the village and see actual people living in there. 
Uh, so it, it wasn't just a tourist village. It's actually like a, a community, Natural community. There, which is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, there's a similar village uh, by Mount Fuji, by the lakes, not far away from Kaguchiko. But basically, it's a museum. So you have about, I don't know, 12 to 18 houses there. And it's all like mm, built, created museum with thatched roofs. Looks yeah. very nice with Mount Fuji in the background, but nobody lives there. Yeah, I bet. Um, what did you think of the keynote this year? Asby Brown did the keynote talking about beautiful alternatives. How do we want to build lessons from Japan? Of course, Asby has such a long career working in architecture and carpentry in Japan, written many books. Uh, how did you find the keynote? Were you there? I was there. I was very happy to see his presentation finally because until now I've always missed it. Uh, so it was a great speech and his approach and the things he values about the carpentry and traditional architecture. That's a very beautiful way of perceiving it. Like, I really love the presentation. Yeah, fantastic. Did you uh, go? Here's, here's just some uh, photos. Yeah, yeah, I was there. I loved it. And Asby has been one of the Minka masters uh, with Alex Kerr and Takeshita san over the last three summits. So it was great to see him uh, as the keynote speaker this time. It's exciting to think who's going to be the keynote next time. Who are they going to pass on the baton to, right? I, I actually know one Japanese master here in Shizuoka. Uh, we could uh, per persuade him. Uh, that uh, person, Matsunaga-san, is a friend of Takishita-san's. So... Uh, and he's been renovating Kominka's his whole life. And he would be a very good adept to join the community. He's up to it. That's awesome. I'm, I'm showing some pictures from my Minka Summit uh, experience. I didn't take too many. Uh, in this picture also is the nearby to the venue place um, in Hanase called mm -hmm. Highland Inn. And they have renovated their old house into a beautiful restaurant and guest house and served amazing food. So that was always a treat for me when it's in Hanase Village to go have a meal with Simon. He's such a great chef. <laughs> a little sneaky trip. Uh, here's from uh, visiting the designer's atelier um, mm -hmm. with the straw thatch. And me and you up there at the top are cheeky smiles. And a lovely and, toilet. Uh, they're horses that they have uh, rescued from slaughter, also their compost toilet, which I was very impressed with. Um, and that's that kind of leads nicely into our talk about urban planning later. Uh, sewage, of course, is part of the infrastructure we need. And then uh, as you're walking around uh, Minka Summit, you can see some authors like Asby Brown. Uh, my same expression every time I'm taking a photo with an author, apparently. Uh, Emily, who also did a workshop with plastering, right? Did you catch Emily's plastering workshop at all? I missed that one. I was having a presentation on that time. Did you catch it? I was I was moderating a panel at the same time, yeah. Um, here's uh, some of my partner's photographs, so from the village of Miyama visit, and then uh, some of the presentations, and then the Minka Mall as well. I think a very good thing to happen next year would be you know, like take videos of everybody's presentations and upload them so the presenters can watch the other people's presentation if they miss them or are presenting themselves. That would like, be great. That's uh, why this, I'm super this, happy for Asby's presentation. Yeah, right? Uh, this was from the panel I was moderating on uh, retaining the heritage of your minka or traditional home. Here's Brett Rasmussen uh, describing how he finds treasures in the attic of the houses that he restores. And right next to him is Shelly Clark, who talked about restoring her uh, house. I think she met Shelly last home. week. You you saw her last week? Yeah, she was walking in the village, which I'm renovating with my company. <laughs> she was just there to walk her Hello, hello. hello. All these great connections from Minka Summit, you can follow up 
and uh, go and visit people and see them again. It's it's kind of like that, right? Like the Minka Summit, one of the nicest things for me is being able to see some of the same people year after year and meet new people and hear about new ideas and areas that I hadn't really thought about. How about for you? Any big takeaways this year? I think the Minka Mall is the best thing that's happening. Uh, this is like a problem in Japan, and not only in Japan, but like I think worldwide right now, that we have problems with artisans, with people working as carpenters, people doing uh, tiles, you know, like every workplace. Like it's complicated. Even people collaborating with our architectural office, the builders are getting older. There's no young people working manually. My carpenters are kind of older, you know. Sometimes I feel bad that I want to help them because it's a 70 years old grandpa still working, you know, as a carpenter. Like, of course, their skills are amazing. Sometimes it gets funnier because they forget what we talked about in the morning during the day. But we need to bring and I don't know, raise up a new generation of people who could do traditional work on the sites. And I think one of the ways how to promote that is actually something like Minka Mall, where as a kid or a young person, you can experience how to thatch a roof, how to build a typical construction, you know, how to use a planner, how to use a saw and, you know, have people try it out. And that could inspire somebody to, you know, oh, I want to become a carpenter. Oh, I want to do traditional Japanese styles or, you know, there's a lot of work that can be done. And I think this is, for me personally, the biggest value it has. Like, it's so important. Like, even in my hometown back in Slovakia, like, there's only few people who can do, in Japanese, it's called bunking. Um, I'm sorry, my Japanese architectural language is better than English already. Uh, let me uh, retranslate that. Bunking. Bunking. Is that like... Uh... Fitting like joinery, fitting the joints together. Uh, it's uh, using the sheet metals on the roofs and on the eaves of the roofs, and uh, creating the drainage for like the rain and drains and everything. So even here, like in Shizuoka, there's only few people who can do that, and it's gonna get worse because every young person right now wants to go to university, get a good job. That's how we were raised by our parents. And I think we may have made the mistake, uh, boomers and millennials, somewhere on the go, that everybody right now wants to go to uni and get a good job. And I don't think, you know, like necessarily that carpentry is work worse than doing like office work. Like you right. get to be outside, you know, on the air, sure. you know. Yeah. I, I think I see the trend a lot in other countries of going to trade school, uh, learning a craft learning hands-on skills. Uh, that was one of the questions I had at the Mink Masters the last on the last panel. Um, I said to the Masters, Takesh, Sasana, and Asbi Brown, how can we develop a love of old houses and traditional techniques in Japan for the future? And I was kind of hoping they would say, of course, it should be part of the curriculum and everything, right? All the education. Um, but what they did say was really beautiful, that they should just make it really fun for kids to go and experience old houses and yep. doing old skills as, as field trips and projects. And I thought that was a great answer. Which, which brings an opportunity, perhaps, create a workshop here in Shizuoka with students and have them come for the Minka we're going to disassemble and like participate. That could be good. Yeah, for sure. Getting getting kids because, more involved. Yeah. And young people, because even me as a, working as an architect here in Japan, I'm afraid that in 10, 15 years, there's going to be nobody to work with. Like, yeah. it may get to the point that I myself may, become a, may have to become a carpenter and, you know, do other stuff myself because there's not going to be enough people who can do it anymore. I, I feel the same way about gardening and growing your own food. Like it's, there's such a decrease in farmers now that we all have to learn these things because these are going to be survival skills 
Um, one of the things Emily said about education, when I talked to her on the show, uh, she, we, here she is with her second book that just came out uh, during the Minka Summit. That was really exciting to see that. Um, but she was talking about that trade schools and learning crafts like plastering. Oh, yay, you got it. Nice. Of course. Uh, learning crafts like plastering was was possible when she first came to Japan. She joined a craft trade school where she was practicing plastering with experts and a bunch of other students. But now it's it's no longer like to have these community spaces where people can go who are interested to learn the skills as well. That would be wonderful to see come back in communities in Japan, right? And not to mention that traditional earthen wall in your master's bedroom is the best thing you can have your, for your health as a healthy building because it breathes, it, uh, um, it adjusts the humidity in the interior. There's less dust thanks to it, you know, less mites. It, there's a group of Japanese scientists who are doing a research on that and they have very nice data about that having just one wall in your bedroom made from traditional plaster wall or like earthen wall preferably is so healthy and so good for us humans rather than you know having a wallpaper or plaster board and these hard surfaces that do not adapt to the environment yeah, absolutely so. and that's that's one of the reasons uh when we had our old house remodeled that one of the things i learned how to do i was do some shikui some natural mm -hmm. plastering and i got my kids involved and when you're using natural materials you don't have to worry about it being toxic when you've got it around kids and it absorbs the smell so it it always you know smells good and in, in the house i think and um, you yeah. just try it, it's easy to repair. You just yeah. mix up some new earthen you walls. Mess it up, you just do another it. layer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's very forgiving. I love that. Um, now, Mito, let's trans transfer to our main topic a little bit. So we're talking about urban planning and what makes good urban design when you're giving recommendations. You've done a lot of great work in Japan, you've got insights also um, from Europe that when you did your training. Now, when we're starting, can I just show you some things that I noticed in Kyoto when I was there last weekend? Yes, please. And yes, I please. really appreciate in terms of sustainable travel and urban planning. And then you can comment on it. How does that sound? Okay, sounds good. Okay. Sounds amazing. So let's Go for start. It. I love this about Kyoto. Mm. So Kyoto always gets a bad rap about over tourism it's always in the news in a negative way but every time i visit kyoto i'm so impressed with all the good things they're doing and so i i wrote a medium article with some of these points which i think they have done and are doing well and it's a good example for other areas and one of them i see that you put in your uh, photos as well having waterways going through the city. Now, Kyoto does this so beautifully with trees and water. This is a great feature, right? It's good, and it cools down the city. And it That's creates, good. you know, a nice place and space for people to go for a walk when you hear the water. It's something relaxing. It helps with the microclimate. That's super important, I think. So, yeah, if it's done well, those places are very popular yeah and it's pretty right and they have a lot of businesses right along these canal streets and so the business is also benefiting from having that soothing sound for their customers uh, well, dulling down the city noise you know the audio experience is also better right that has been in kyoto and japan ever since ever since the cities were being made that was kind of a concept that uh, you would have a tea house by a river and you would go to the tea house on a small boat and a canal or channel that was man-made. And these things are still alive in a few places in Japan, which is amazing. Unfortunately, nearly all was lost in Tokyo. That's a bummer. Right now they need to figure out what to do with the city <laughs> on that part. And it's going to be a new challenge. Yeah. And in Hiroshima as well, we used to have a lot of riverways in the city center, uh, but unfortunately, most of them have been covered over and they became the tram lines. 
Um, so they still have like the names of waterways, but they're the tram lines now. Uh, if we brought through more water, I mean, we've got seven branches of the river going through the city, which is lovely. But mm -hmm. maybe if we had some more small canals in areas that are pedestrianized, that would really enhance the city as well. Well, um, I'm not sure that I could or should call myself an urban planner. My friend from Prague is much more uh, suited. Yet, when it comes to urban planning here in Japan, how the cities are made, like it's important to understand the history, I think. It explains a lot about how Japanese people think about building cities. And maybe a good start would be a small history talk about like Tokyo Edo, which used to be farmland of about 50,000 population back in uh, uh, 400 years ago, basically. And then uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu started building his fortress there, right? And within 20 years, the population went up from 50,000 to nearly 600,000 people. And the whole city of Tokyo was built on waterways and canals and channels. And the Sumidagawa and the Edogawa, two big rivers, one of them is here on the pictures, were supplying the city with construction material. That's why you have uh, a station named Kiba. In Japanese, kanji stands for a tree and a place because they were bringing down the logs from up the mountains. Then they would store them there. They would prepare them for construction and then they would move them on the canals and channels through the city. And then they man dug a huge river to bring fresh water and to supply water for the moats. You would have inner and outer moats. And the topography of Tokyo is interesting. Like all professionals talk about it, that you have the lowlands where the merchants used to live, and then you have the upper lands. And it's like Yamanote. It's like fingers of a mountain going into like a flatlands. And at the tip, at the end of one fingers, is the imperial palace right now, or the castle Tokugawa who built. And it was so well designed and thought through. Like they had fresh water canal supply beneath the ground from wooden pipes you know it was so well engineered and designed and tokyo have been growing bigger and bigger and bigger ever since it was founded because the layout was so done so well and well thought through that the natural river flow through the city would mean that the river would not stagnate you know it would not rot and uh, it was very well protected on top of it. And it was so accessible that you would always have tea houses accessible by those boats. You would have markets, you would have restaurants, and you would have the inner city. And then behind the gates, you would have temples on top of hills. And that's why those areas right now are super popular because Back in the time, you'd get outside of the city gates. Inside of the city gates, you would have to behave. It was everything strict, you know. Everybody has their hierarchy, how you're supposed and what you're supposed to do. And then once you get out, it was free. So right now, Kagurazaka on a slope, you have the leftovers on a vault gate and a bridge of Idabashi. And then that was the old geisha town. And it was up on a hill. And same goes for Shinjuku. Takada no Baba, Ikebukuro, Shibuya, Roppongi. And this concept is kind of repeating throughout the whole, like, Japan and old cities. So I think, and, and the main reason why Japanese cities feel different for us is that there's no squares, no public squares like we have. And one of the reasons was that the ruling class, the samurais, they didn't want people to riot, so you're not going to create a square for people to gather. You would have a street. That's why Japan has shopping guys. The shopping streets are always perpendicular, mostly, on the train stations and go out to the city and then the city starts spreading from out there. So the picture you're showing right now, it's the plan of Shizuoka, which Shizuoka City, where Tokugawa Ieyasu is from. And... Uh, you can see the big uh, place in the center, so that used to be the castle, which doesn't stand anymore, unfortunately. It was very pretty. And then the city is all around it, and you can see a thin red line going through the city, that's the Tokaido, which is the road that used to go 
the main road between Tokyo and Osaka and Kyoto. And uh, all the cities, like even Shizuoka and a lot of pictures of Tokaido are famous by Hokusai, right? His paintings of the Tokaido 53 paintings. And then viewings of Mount Fuji, the 36 paintings, which actually ended up being 46. And like, if you go deeper into it and you look up your history, then it kind of starts making sense. And then uh, what happened with Hiroshima, as you mentioned, the same happened in Tokyo, that after the destruction of the world wars and a rapid urbanization, uh, they mostly put metros, you know, inside of the water canals and paved them to create streets. So that is the main Ginza shopping street right now in Tokyo, for example. Right. And well, the city well, has changed a lot. I mean, one of the things I really appreciate about how the vision of they wanted to rebuild Hiroshima as the city of peace, a place where people wanted to live. And so one of the strategies was to make high quality of life. How do you do that? You put uh, pedestrianized areas, cycle-friendly areas, lots of parks along the, the riverside. Uh, you have good public transportation, like all of the basics of a quality of life. So I think that's one of the reasons I love living here. You know, if you, I think if they you did have it well a well-planned city, right? It's, it's, I think Hiroshima on that part is better than Shizuoka. Shizuoka is great because it's uh, compact. It's nice and easy to live in. But the problem is that there's non-existent uh, public transport. It's rough to get around. Uh, there's not enough uh, bicycle paths, you know. You can't, there's not enough places to leave your bicycle. So, um, so I hope it's going to change for better. And I think it will. The city finally started doing uh, workshops with uh, citizens on what you do or do not like in the city to get some opinions. And I think well, let's, worked... let's continue with Kyoto and then we'll get into that okay. a bit more. Okay. All right. So uh, another thing that I noticed Kyoto is doing, which I know that you're passionate about as well. Look at this. They have good trees all along the walkways and in the middle of the car streets. I was very impressed with the planning for trees, for shade, for quality of life, for healthier air. Uh, this is something that we're seeing a lot of problems in Japan where trees are being cut down in the city centers. So it's, it's wonderful to see Kyoto is preserving and maintaining these. Some of the, of the cities are getting it right. Unfortunately, lately I've been collaborating with people from Urban Planning Office in Shizuoka and looks like there's a movement right now for maintenance-free and uh, falling leaves are considered a nuisance. So what's happening a lot, unfortunately, is that they chop off the branches with leaves before they shed. And they create like stumps of trees all around the Japan and they keep tearing out the trees and the new ones they reimplant, you know, are small because they are maintenance free. And I think this is a very popular picture from like social media going around, but this seriously literally works. Like there is a professor in Czechia that did a research on how warm does a meadow filled with grass get hot in summer. How hot does uh, unused ground or dirt, earth dirt gets, and how hot it goes on top of a concrete or asphalt? And you know, you don't have to be clever or you know a genius to understand that a natural shade from a tree is the most needed. Trees, plants breathe through leaves. While breathing, they you know evaporate moisture. They are cooling down the cities for us. A tree can cool down without any expenses your city a lot. And I think I sent you a few pictures from Prague of huge trees filled up with trees. I was back home last year and this tree that didn't have any trees was going 38, 40 degrees in summer. But the streets with trees were going 32, 35 most. So you can feel 3 to 8 Celsius of uh degrees like difference like everywhere and like 
this is where it gets interesting. Like Japan has the bonsai, right? So I think that's why they don't mind chopping off, off all the branches and stuff. Back in Europe, when I started university, as your first year and you have your first urban planning classes, they tell you that, oh, you know, a uh, tree equals a house, a building, and you need them in the city. This is a picture of a Houston. Like, Houston has done it so well. They have a green canopy all over the city, and it cools it down very nicely. And Houston is a very good example for Japan, I think, when it comes to big trees, because it does get very humid there, similar to Japan. And the next picture you show, that's, once again, a picture from Shizuoka, where I live. And uh, as you can see, there's just one big tree, and that's it. All the other trees are being trimmed and kept small, because due to traffic law, the tree or the branches mustn't go into the road up to four point uh, four four and a half meters height. So what's happening in a lot of places, unfortunately, is they chop all the branches and keep the tree as tall as as four and a half meters because it's so so much easier. And so this is it in Shizuoka. This was middle of a summer when I took this before these beautiful trees like shed their leaves, you know, and so the branches aren't big enough. And when you do this, you know, with all the paved surfaces, and once again, paved surfaces and concrete in Japan, maintenance-free, easy to use in Japanese, benri, convenient, for the sake of convenience, there's no natural infiltration surfaces other than parks, and there's a lot of concrete, hard surfaces. So what's happening, the, city, the cities are overheating, and if you don't um, regulate how the developers can build high-rise buildings, then you create wind tunnels in the city. How you break wind tunnels? With huge, big trees. And then they chop off the branches. I think those trees are struggling in August when it's super hot and they have no way how to cool themselves down after they lose all that stuff. And that's why I'm super happy for this picture. This is the new Azabudai area in Tokyo where they did a huge new development. As then you can see, the trees owned by the city, if you can go back one picture, the trees owned by the city are by the roads. They are small. And the trees owned by the developer are big. They are on the right side. They plant the big trees. So I think this could be a very good project for Japan to learn from, that we need more greenery in the city to cool it down. Um, here in Shizuoka, for example, there's a lot of mountains outside of the city, and you can see green mountains everywhere. So people go like, oh, there's a lot of trees up in the mountains. We don't need trees in the city. But it's getting so hot here that you go out and you get a heat stroke. And before we started it live, right, it's end of May, and we're already like, oof, it's so hot right now. This is a picture from home, you know, and we have a lot of trees. This is very popular in Europe. You have big tree, and you have coffee shops having their tables outside and you just sit down and even though it's hot outside you know it feels nice you get the breeze from the moisture moving the microclimate it does help a lot and i actually saw this umbrella idea uh in nagasaki when i went to house Stambosch, uh in summer and i think it's it's easy idea if you have trees and you have awnings in between you could add some colorful umbrellas maybe japanese style umbrellas i love this idea it's it's nice i'm a little bit worried how that's gonna uh, uh do during a typhoon <laughs> yeah no 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 you would want to take it down before heavy winds <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, that was a great, a great connection to that last picture. Let's continue with my Kyoto talk pictures here. Uh, pedestrianized areas. Now, this is. It seems like a no-brainer uh, where you're gonna have, where you want to have a lot of people shopping and walking around, having certain times of the day, especially at busy times, where you don't allow traffic. Now, London has done this all the time with limiting who can come into the city. If you're a resident, you don't pay. But if you're not a resident, you have to pay a lot more. I notice other cities doing this. Hiroshima does this in the city center. Uh, if you're delivering or if you live in the area, you can come in before or after the crowds. Uh, what do you think about pedestrianized zones? Is it a good idea? It's great. Cities were made for people, not for cars. Uh... It should be, you know, easy to 
gap around, and it's a huge trend right now. All of rural Japan, outside of Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, Hiroshima, like big cities, everybody right now wants walkable, walkable city. Even my city office here, let's make a city walkable. And that was the workshop we did. And I don't think they're getting all the points what means to have a real walkable city yet. I hope uh, people are going to get there after studying a little bit more. But it's, it's important. It's great. People enjoy it. You know, citizens, like you close the streets. It's starting to happen, like, you know, uh, on the weekends more and more. I think, if I remember correctly, the first... The first walkable pedestrian street happened in Hokkaido, in Hakodate. Uh, I think about like uh, 1973, if I remember correctly, from a presentation of the city. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it's much needed. But this means if you make a pedestrian area, you need more green trees to provide shade. You need nice surface on the road to walk on. If you pave your pedestrian area with, you know, concrete and asphalt, it gets so hot during the summer, you're getting like fry pan when you walk there. That's why those places deserve to be paved with either stone or other stone material tiles that don't get as hot. And that's so important. Make it barrier free, uh, which needs to be done well, you know. Uh, that was a great thing in Prague uh, when we started university as architects. Uh, like architecture and urban planning class, you would have to take a wheelchair and go around Prague on a wheelchair as a student to test how easy or difficult it is. And uh, unfortunately, such practice I haven't heard of here in Japan. So I keep telling people from uh, city office that do a workshop. Go and try it yourself because... Many places are not as easy to, you know, get and walk through. I think that's really important. I mean, one of the things I love about this view is how mm. nice it is to walk and how it meanders. I yeah. like that design, yeah. but it should still be accessible to people in wheelchairs or people walking yes. with a cane. We have to think about uh, not having steps everywhere, having slopes where people would have to go up onto a curb. For example, accessible cities, especially with an aging population in Japan, we <laughs> make accessible cities. That's good for everybody, right? Yep, that's much needed. Japan is going to be a very good uh, experiment for the world, I think, with how fast it's the population is aging. Yeah. Now, that's a, one of the beautiful things I love about all these small alleyways in Kyoto and how they're reusing, this is a new build, but they mm -hmm. have done it in traditional aesthetic design. So it really yes. fits into the traditional vibe of the city center, which I think we're talking zoning laws here, we're talking regulations, but also what local people want to see happen, right? No. Um, and so getting, getting that idea that this is our brand, this is what we want. And of course, it has appeal for locals, but also for visitors. They want to see places like this. Um, but then again, it might be too narrow for a wheelchair. So when we're making these new traditional versions, let's also think about, is it accessible? That it shouldn't take too much to make it both, right? Yeah, it, it shouldn't. Like, you need to think about it from the start and like get it done but i really like this picture you're showing i really love those traditional japanese rain protectors on the walls like that's so nice it gives Isn't it a special gorgeous? vibe yeah i heard i heard one japanese guide say that it was to stop ninjas from invading your house but i i, <laughs> I think you're right i think you're right it's mostly a, a rain protection it's beautiful it's a rain protection for a house foundation beam that sits on uh, stone so it doesn't get wet and uh, rot away. Because you do see that. Off. You'll see the wear and tear of a wooden building along the bottom, right? Yes. Uh, one, one other idea I saw recently, which I love, the reuse of old Japanese traditional tile, roof tiles. Uh, they use the roof tiles that you're, you're doing new tiles. So what are you doing with the old tiles? 
you put them along the bottom and it actually works as a splash guard as well. And mm -hmm. it looks beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And less garbage, less waste. Yay. Um, I also like, and I think this goes back to the idea of adding water. Uh, so one of the traditional things you'll see, especially as it's getting hotter, people will go and put water in front of their walkways, in front of their houses uh, to cool down the area. And I think this goes along with the idea of canals, uh, having fountains in concrete, like squares and things like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, like I think Europe right now when it comes to like sustainable modern cities is doing very well um, and a lot of clever people working on a lot of projects that you would have small fountains with water elements that allows for kids to play in summer helps with the microclimate this is a picture from Prague and like uh, I haven't seen much of those in Japan yet uh, I think more of those like um, Barrier free water elements could be utilized and used. Uh, this is from my home, a small water channel, just you know. In some uh, towns, like classic towns, like in uh, the famous pottery area in Yamaguchi, is it Hagi? Along the city streets, and they have all the canals along the street. So this reminded me of that, uh, where they you can even see koi fish swimming up and down the side of the street so to maintain that it's it's classic it's appealing it brings visitors in but it's also keeping it cooler and uh, this in the middle of the street is a really cool design so this is from europe eh? yeah this is from my hometown it's it's nice maybe it could be a little bit bigger you know <laughs> yeah no even even a little bit right uh, it has a cooling effect, but also a beautiful uh, reflection effect um, as part of the aesthetic. All right, let's talk about kids' parks. Oh, yes. Uh, so in Kyoto, I thought this was like in Japanese, you might say bimyo, uh, right? Like it's, it's right. almost good or it's not as good as it could be or it's not as bad as it sometimes is um so we've got a little bit of shade we've got places to sit but where the kids go on that metal slide and on the swings there's no shade um why aren't why isn't there more shade in kids parks right i mean this is when i had kids i wouldn't let a, i wouldn't take them to the park if the slide was metal and the sun was shining and it was a hot day they'd burn themselves you know so having shade as an element of parks, having water fountains. There's so few water fountains, even in parks, where people can drink water, you know, refill their containers. These are things that we can definitely implement to improve, right? And, and Japanese people feel it. They understand it. When we had the workshop here in the city, a lot of people same, said the same thing, that it's chotto bimyo and that uh, the green parts are not connected, that there's no sh enough of shade in the city, and especially the kids' playgrounds. I think I sent you a picture of one with a huge tree, which is just a stump in the middle, and this was taken at the end of October before the tree would shed the leaves. They chopped it off. Yeah, I remember putting that in my collection here, Sad Park. Oh, here it is. Sad park, yes. Yes, sad play park. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't take my children to play there anyway. Like, this is very sad for me. And then if you, you know, trees take a while to grow. So one stopgap you could do, which I saw in Australia in kids' parks, they had those tarps above the kids' slides and play areas. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very conscious of UV and the sun in Australia. They have a lot of skin cancer. Um, but, you know, we have two hot days. We have skin cancer in Japan, too. Um, so having the tarp above to create shade is a nice, like, stopgap until your trees can grow, right? Yeah, it's, it's a very good idea. The, the, like, kids' playgrounds in Japan, I feel they're more of a fry pan rather than a playground when it comes and no grass because grass is it looks like weeds it's one it looks messy it's kind of goes along with the leaves argument that we don't like leaves on the ground it um, goes back to zero have, maintenance right it's maintenance but when yes. you have grass 
It's also a carbon capture. It's also cooler. So yes. having a few weeds, but having grass would be better than having dirt, right? And plus, mm -hmm. when you have dirt and you have a windy day, all the dirt blows everywhere. You know, I mean, there's there are problems with not having grass, not having plants. I right? totally agree with you on that one. <laughs> now, this was one of the shady path pictures that you had. And you often mm -hmm. see like a long pathway to a house or to a temple. This beautiful traditional Japanese idea of the hedges, the grass, often there's moss on the bottom as well, uh, interplay between the trees and the lanterns and the traditional design. What a gorgeous example here. Where is that? Like, Japanese gardens are so genius and done so well. So I personally have a hard time understanding why these principles were not implemented in like overall city planning i think a lot of it had to do with like you know the population growth post-war and the city spread so much that they didn't have a plan it was just you know naturally growing out growing out and getting so gigantic and right now it's a good time to like slowly get it fixed um i i think it's five years i've been to beijing and I was super well surprised because as a growing as a kid, you would hear that, oh, dirty China, you don't see like blue sky, you know, it's all smog and it's all like, you know, not nice and clean. You, you can barely breathe the air. And I went there five years ago and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. They planted trees by the roads everywhere. They created a green canopy. There's so much shade. Of course, right now they have pollen issues and allergies because a lot of same trees, but that's, you know, fixable. And and they cool down the sea, uh, the, 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 not the city, the city. I could see blue sky. So the original image I had was completely different. And that was done with planting a lot of trees, like all around the city and in the city. And I loved it. And then I came back, it was in May, Golden Week. And I got back to Japan, and Japan was much, much hotter because of all the, you know, hard concrete surfaces, no maintenance. You go to countryside, you go to Kofu in Yamanashi, that's a fry pan over there. Like, it's, it's kind of sad for me. And a lot of friends, foreigners who visit keep saying that outside of gardens, of course, Japanese cities are kind of gray, you know, a lot of concrete jungle. And, and I think that could be done better on that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, especially, uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but how you have height limits. Uh, that was one of the things, I don't have a picture here, but one of the things that really impressed me in Kyoto as well was you obviously have certain areas of the city where you have a height limit. You don't build above the existing roof line. And it looks like here, Tokyo has done that. Uh, you have higher buildings all in a cluster. You have lower buildings in, in certain areas. So that in Kyoto, uh, this is of Tokyo, of course, but in Kyoto, uh, if you get high enough above the roof, you can see like Todaiji Temple coming up. You can see that beautiful temple landmark. And you can see the mountains behind Kyoto City. That is just so well planned. That is a beautiful consequence of someone with that vision to make the city like that, right? So yeah. even Hiroshima was planned, they had a vision, but now we're starting to see one tall building come up over here, one tall building come up over here, like, and we're starting to lose our views. Uh, you see that in Himeji when you pass through, you can't see Himeji Castle um, because they allowed too many high buildings to block the castle view from the train. These are things that tourists notice when they visit Japan, right? So if you have the chance to plan your city, to do urban planning that we're talking about, uh, you're doing a long-term appeal and brand for your destination, right? Well, when it comes to Shizuoka, I'm not sure about Kyoto or like Tokyo or Hiroshima or parts. When I spoke with people who are at the Department of Urban Planning, they basically don't have any urban plan. They don't do any. They rely on local developers. That's why Japan has so-called machizukuri, 
which is bottom-up system for local communities to fix their local community uh, because there's no vision, there's no plan. They kind of just go with the flow, unfortunately. They allow in downtown area to build a two-story family house, which for me is ridiculous. Yet they allow a high-rise all around two-story family houses to be built, you know, at the edge of the city. And I think that's one of the reasons. So I'm trying to tell them that, listen, like, there's a reason why European cities are, in many cases, nice and Japanese people like that. But it's because we are conscious of that. And we have, for me, we have something called, like, top-down system. And the city, the urban planning office takes care of it. You create a master plan. And then you create zonings and regulations. Japan, because of the fast spread, has a different system. They have uh, light limitations. That's why you see a lot of weird roof houses all around the country. But uh, I think a good chance right now is to come up with either um, um, uh, guidelines if you don't have a master plan that please at least obey these guidelines or create a master plan essentially eventually to decide what our city is going to look like in 30 40 years 50 years and let's not just you know let it for like developers randomly build up land and then get a permit and build a high rise because then you end up creating wind tunnels as already mentioned you block landmarks but um for tokyo the interesting thing Japan has a bad um, history with fires in towns, right? And uh, back in Europe, we are used to something what we call a city block. Japan came up with this thing called the super block. And super block is, consists of six, nine, 12 blocks connected together. And then you have a huge road in between those blocks, those super blocks, which works as a fire prevention now the fire is not going to spread from one super block to another. And it's an earthquake disaster control road, mostly, that if something happens, the road is so wide that it can accumulate people to run away and, you know, take cover and uh, repair the city. And because of this fire fear, if I could call it that way, they build a lot of higher rise buildings all around the super block creating a rim that's why if you walk in tokyo and you think about it you have high buildings and then you just walk one street inside of the block of the super block and you have two-story family houses and you cannot even hear the you know bustling city and the cars and the traffic it's so quiet so this super block thing creates a very good thing i in my opinion that you get private areas inside of the block where, you know, local people and communities go to. And then you have, like, high, higher buildings all around. One thing, what we, I think, both agree on, those big streets could use big trees. There's something bigger than five meters tall. As you can see, Tokyo, everything, barely any green. Just a park in front of the river, and that's it, unfortunately. But, yeah... I think uh, because of the movement of walkable cities in Japan, I think this is going to slowly change. So uh, oh, that's, that's really good insight. I didn't know about that. Um, but that makes a lot of sense when you look at cities like Tokyo. Uh, yes. You mentioned this area before. It's also great to see new designs uh, which incorporate trees and greenery as a part of the building design. What a gorgeous building here. Well, that's Hatterswick Studio, you know. They are super famous architectural studio. I'm so happy for what they did with Azabude Hills. And I can imagine how hard they must have had to get the permits and, you know, to push through to get the green roofs, to plant a lot of trees and stuff. Because I know how my city is, you know, approaching that matter. And it's just... They just keep chopping down big trees and replacing them with small for easy maintenance. So this is a very good example for Japan to learn from. And I'm super happy that this was done. And one important thing, uh, interesting, that can explain a lot of stuff about Japan. Uh, police department has a huge say in urban planning. 
or let's say uh, road safety. So, and they kind of do not unfortunately collaborate necessarily with the urban departments. So if an accident happens, they decide, okay, we need to put another bollard or something here, prevention, and they do it on their own. I think they could collaborate more to be conscious of how the city looks like. So you don't end up with what I call in my city a bollard hell. It's a pedestrian, very super barrier, unwalkable, unfriendly area. And it's the biggest main street where festivals are, you know, run. So I think a little bit more control over how certain government entities can participate in that could be helpful. Yeah. I, I love this street that you, I know you're, that's that same beautiful area. They've done a great job, but I notice this a lot when they design new areas, it looks beautiful. And then two weeks after they open it, you start noticing these plastic cones, which become part of the permanent design. Now, I know this is maybe a safety concern, but why this, can't this we, was like in Kyoto, in Kyoto at least, they cover the cones with beautiful bamboo. So you, you still kept away from the danger, but it fits in, <laughs> it looks nice, it has a beautiful aesthetic. But come on, Japan, too many plastic cones everywhere. <laughs> oh, we love the plastic, you know, in this country. <laughs> Uh, I'm almost done with my Kyoto stuff. There's one more point we have. We touched on maybe slightly, but uh, having cycle lanes. So one thing in Kyoto I was impressed with, the cycle lanes were most on the big roads. The cycle lanes were separate from cars and separate from pedestrians. And I think this is something you don't often see in Japan. It would no. be nice to see more of uh, where the pedestrian is safe the cyclist is safe, the cars don't accidentally run into pedestrians and cars without really thinking about where they're going across and being a bit more careful. Um, and I, it wasn't everywhere in Kyoto, but I did notice they're obviously doing it as part of planning new roads. Impressed. And this is not rocket science. In Western Europe, they figured out how to do it well and properly. I would love for Japan to hire professionals from there and have them design it rather than them trying to figure it out here. Uh, last weekend, my friend took me on a bicycle in Chigasaki and Enoshima, and I was terrified of the bicycle road because it's a huge road with a lot of cars. I had a truck going like 10 centimeters next to me, like, oh my goodness. And a lot of people on the workshop here in Shizuoka said that they would love to use more bicycle if they could. You know, it's a flat city here. It's perfect but they don't feel safe. But also having bicycle parking. I did notice if you go, if you cycle into like a city center shopping area, they always had bicycle parking. Maybe you have to pay a hundred yen for six hours or something, but you make it reasonable. You make it orderly and efficient, but you don't make a city center without bicycle parking. Well, you know, like you have to kids. think about that part. <laughs> Teenagers and kids complain about having to pay 100 yen. I think they should make an exception for youngsters. Yeah. Well, at least having it is important, right? Yeah. Not just making car parks. Um, we want to encourage people to cycle more. It's healthier for people. It's better for the community. Uh, it keeps the air clean because it's zero emissions. Yay! And it's very... <laughs> inexpensive way how to provide accessibility in a lot of cities in Japan where the buses aren't that good or you don't have trains other than just one line going through the city so bicycles are a very good way how to provide accessibility and I would hope that's gonna you know become more common here yeah well so many great ideas here so far Amito we have two one more minute anything we didn't touch on that you want to mention is important for urban planning in Japan I don't know um I wish um <laughs> it's a long topic uh more ex uh, exterior insulation in Japan Japan needs to figure out the insulation and sufficiency there's there uh putting photovoltaic panels on all roofs in Tokyo is not going to help with electricity shortages in summer 
and one way how to cool down the city is through the trees and plants and green belts you know connecting the parks so um i think a nice theory would be to tell the people responsible for urban planning in japan to realize that people going in summer to hospital from a heat stroke it's their responsibility because if you design the city well you can cool it down naturally and it's going to be so much needed in the future i'm afraid and more yeah. natural even, permeable even, now, even now in may <laughs> it is already reaching 30 degrees in many parts of japan and it's not humid yet and and we are getting hotter and hotter every year so this kind of in investment in trees investment in cooler infrastructure investment in renewable energy and insulation these are things that we should all be thinking about as consumers as well as city planners right we can yes. do it on both sides how do you remember rainy seasons in japan you've been here longer than i've been <laughs> it's much shorter now so we might yeah. have water shortages as well right i, I and remember having more first trees time. helps with retaining water so let's think about the benefit of trees for water as well right yes I remember nine years ago, rainy season started. It didn't stop raining for six weeks every single day. Oh my God, that was rain hell. And right now, it's barely raining. You know. Yeah. Last year, it's it's changing. Yeah. The, so maybe maybe next time we can talk about water features and water conservation <laughs> as well. Uh, that is our hour. Thank you so much, Mito. So many great ideas here. We started talking about the Minka Summit this year. Uh, we spent most of the time talking about great strategies for good urban planning that's better for people, planet, and profits. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Yeah. And thank you. Big thanks to Mito. So many great ideas here. Yeah, thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much, JJ. <laughs> Let's do it again. Thanks again. Yeah, Thanks, thank everyone. You Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Back bye. To work. Let you